This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, I'm Paul Dickerson, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. First up today, Peter Duncan, founder and executive chairman of Micro Seismic, a company he founded in his spare bedroom in 2003, telling us how he worked his way to very profitable 2012. Next up, Chris Wolf, a partner with the law firm of Haynes & Boone, talking about the oil field services business and all the challenges that they face. All that right after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome to another episode of the Energy Maker Show. We have with us today Peter Duncan, founder and executive chairman of Micro Seismic Inc. Peter, great to have you on the program. Paul, it's great to be here. Thanks very much. Well, tell us about Micro Seismic. Paul, Microseismic is my baby. Uh, I started it in my spare bedroom in 2003. I was casting about for a new project to take on and got introduced through some friends to a professor in Colorado, Charles Archambault, who had some ideas about how you could use conventional seismology and apply it to the energy business, to the exploration for oil and gas. And how is that? Well, what Charles reckoned was that you could use earthquakes as a source of energy to do imaging, much as we do in oil and gas, uh, to do it in areas where the conventional seismic approaches using dynamite and vibrators and right. cutting lines wouldn't be entirely appropriate. In fact, he had done a couple of projects down in the Amazon jungle, simply putting geophones out on the surface of the earth, turning them on, listening for events to occur, and then using those signals to create images of the subsurface. So you call that passive seismic for obvious reasons. It's not active. It's not creating any bangs artificially. And we thought that we could take passive seismic and apply it to various uh, endeavors within the oil business. Think of passive seismic as to conventional as a stethoscope is to an ultrasound, where what we're going to do is put this stethoscope out on the surface of the earth or near the surface of the earth, listen to all the squishy sounds that emanate from the reservoir as the engineers interact with it, and then somehow feed back to the engineers exactly what's going on in the reservoir in a powerful way. So when you're out there, is it one monitor? Is it a thousand monitors? It's a good question. People have been using sound emanating from the reservoir for a number of years to, to listen to the reservoir. But because those sounds are very, very small, the way they tackled the problem was actually to put geophones on a wireline string and locate it down close to the reservoir. Right. We didn't want to have anything to do with that. We wanted to put our geophones on the surface of the earth because it's difficult to find well bores to stick phones down. Engineers don't like you messing with their well bores. Right. And we reckoned that it would be a lot uh, more cost effective to be able to put these phones on the surface. But think of the problem that if you go to a football game and you're listening to a referee and that we want to hear what his call is. The traditional way of hearing what that call is in the noisy stadium is to put the microphone on his lapel. Sure. He turns on the mic and away you go. That's putting the geophones down near the reservoir. Now imagine the sound man standing over on the side with a big dish microphone. Right. We're the dish microphone and yeah. we create that dish microphone by laying out hundreds, maybe thousands of geophones in an area over the surface of the earth and then in the computer, adding up the signals from those geophones, much as the dish causes you to capture a large portion of the wave coming from uh, across the stadium, we add it up in the in the uh, in the computer, and that allows us to capture those very small signals. And this may sound exotic, 
but it's what conventional geophysicists do every day when they lay out their 3D spread on the surface and image the subsurface in conventional seismic. And how long does that process take? Uh, if you are going out to image the subsurface, you have to wait for nature to create enough sounds to create an image, and that's probably a year of a process. But our major business today is actually doing hydrofrac monitoring. Wow, so you're right in the hot spot of that fracking market. That's really worked out well for us, yes. When they pump the high pressure fluids and sands into the shale rocks to crack them in order to create the opportunity for the gas to escape, every one of those cracks gives off an acoustic signal, a snap, crackle, pop. Right. And we capture those. So the length of that process is just the length of time while they are actually fracking. So that's usually a few days to a few weeks. So it started in 2003. Right. Uh, how big is the company today? We're getting close to uh, 200 people. We're doing upwards of $60 million in annual revenues and expect to increase that by 50% this year. We've been growing on a tremendous steep curve. Can you walk me through briefly the, the, the trajectory of growth? Sure. We started off with a little bit of angel money, about $60,000 worth of angel money, which allowed us to buy business cards and some stationery right. and set up an Internet site. Uh, we then, in that first few months, put together a business plan, and strangely enough, we put together all of the things that we thought we could do with Passive Seismic, from imaging the subsurface to listening to production activities in the reservoir to monitoring CO2 sequestration to right, make right. sure the cap rock was solid. We went, All those things. On the bottom, we put frack monitoring, and that's where our business is today. So the message for all you entrepreneurs is listen to the market and do what they want, not what you think you should. Right. At any rate, we put together a, uh, some, some, a business plan and went to raise enough money, just enough, to prove the science. After all, all we had was Dr. Archambault's word for it, sure. all his ideas. So we raised about uh, half a million dollars from Dirk McDermott, Altera Partners in Denver, and oh. from Chevron Tech Ventures. And we used that over the next three years to try prototype studies. And interestingly enough, almost immediately, we got paying work from oil companies. There was a strong interest in all of the technology that we were bringing to the Great market. Great validation. So that caused us, that allowed us to live through three years of honing our trade without taking any more money. Then in 2006, we thought we'd proved the technology to the point that we wanted to raise enough money to now grow a business, to get out of my spare bedroom, to actually get some office space, buy some equipment of our own, right. some computers. So we raised $7 million from Altera and Chevron, they stayed in, and a new partner, Rockport Capital Partners out of Boston. That $7 million turned us now into a company, and we started on our, our revenue growth. In 2009, we did 11 million, and sorry, in 2009, we did 17 million. In 2010, we did over 50 million in revenue. We kind of finally got that technical acceptance and that business acceptance, and our business took off. Uh, in 2010, we got the the proverbial knock on the door right. from a couple of the uh, usual suspects, and we were actually looking to do an exit to uh, sell the company. And as things progressed, it turned out that the best offer we got, the best valuation we got, was from a private equity firm. So instead of selling to some other big corporation, we sold half the company in a partial liquidation event took some chips off the table for the founders and the original investors, and uh, ended up now with 50% of the company still owned by those original investors, and now we're carrying on, probably heading towards an IPO. A great success story that I know will, will really uh, motivate many of the entrepreneurs uh, in the audience. So what, what, what are the big challenges coming up? The big challenge, uh, I think, uh, today is hiring and retaining the right people. Uh, we've got the technology pretty much figured right. out, and certainly there's competition coming into the market. We have fast followers, and that's great, because right. when you're the only guy out there uh, who's offering something, well, uh, that's lonely, and also it's unbelievable. Yeah. And one of the, our PE investors said, look, show me a company that, that is all by itself, and I'll show you a company with no market. There you go. So getting comp competitors in, that's good for us. Uh, the business, uh, certainly the shale business and the unconventional resources and our frac monitoring, that's growing leaps and bounds. We continue to try to push the value proposition, that is expand what we're, what we're extracting from the data in terms of the knowledge in order to give more value to our clients. But seriously, our biggest problem is hiring people 
and keeping them, getting the, the right kind of people. Turns out that this microseismic, it's kind of flavor of the month over the last couple of years. And as the major oil companies are, are getting into that business and wanting to interpret the data themselves, they look around to hire people in that business. Guess where they go? Sure. And I can't compete with the Exxons and the Shells of the world in terms of hiring practices. Well, we know in the U.S. our domestic market has just been exploding over the last few years. Uh, have, have you charted an international path? Surely. We have, in fact, uh, in the last year done work in China and Turkey and Argentina. Uh, we have a project coming up in Poland. And so we have uh, dangled our line out there to catch some fish. But I will tell you, in terms of hydrofrac monitoring, 95% of the fracking in the world is done in North America, and that's where our market is today. Well, Peter, it's an exciting story, and I appreciate you coming by sharing it with our audience. My pleasure, Paul. Oh, my pleasure. And that concludes our discussion with Peter Duncan. We'll be back with more right after this. is the energy maker show brought to you by nrg moving clean energy forward and now back to the energy maker show with your host paul dickerson welcome back to the energy maker show my guest now chris wolf a partner with the law firm of haynes and boone chris great to have you on the program great to be here paul so tell us a little bit about haynes and boone well haynes and boone is a uh, full service commercial firm representing businesses uh, national offices uh, and some international, but uh, primarily based here in uh, Texas. And you run the Oil Field Services Practice Group. Can you tell us about that? Well, Paul, as much as anybody can run a group of lawyers, yes. <laughs> the uh, Oil Field Service Group is an attempt to uh, uh, focus on representing a particular industry, in this case, oil field services, a very uh, dynamic and exciting uh, industry. I think if you start with oil and gas and you look at the, um, the fact that it's a finite wasting resource and the easy oil and gas has already been recovered, the only way you continue to have production is through ever-increasing innovation. And that's where the oil field service industry steps in. Well, and let's talk about uh, some of the domestic opportunities for these uh, services. Well, domestically, the United States is experiencing quite a renaissance in uh, oil and gas and oil field services. And this is primarily due to the ability to unlock oil and gas that has historically been unavailable in shale formations. The, uh, the shale formations tend to be very hard on equipment. And so not only does it require very advanced equipment, but also equipment of the highest quality. And that makes tremendous opportunities for uh, United States manufactured oil field service products. Well, and leads to some big challenges to overcome. Probably the biggest challenges the industry faces are not technological. Uh, probably the biggest challenges uh, faced are political. Uh, anytime you do oil and gas operations in a highly populated developed country, it's politically sensitive. Uh, there's legitimate concerns over ensuring that uh, the integrity of the water uh, is maintained. So these challenges um, keep increasing the standards that the industry has to meet. And so those are the challenges, but the fact that it gets harder and harder is also a tremendous opportunity as uh, new products and new services are constantly required. And then I guess some opportunities once you uh, figure out how to master those challenges to, to find markets overseas. Well, the clearly uh, oil is a uh, international market. The demand seems to be insatiable. Uh, due to the high energy content and the small volume, there does not seem to be a uh, readily available alternative. And so shale formations are found throughout the world. 
And yes, as the technology has been developed to extract it here in the U.S., there's intense interest throughout the world in bringing that uh, shale extraction technology into other uh, other countries. Now, I know your focus is on the oil field. Uh, how does clean tech play, if at all, into your practice? Well, clean tech uh, fits in uh, through the, uh, I would call it risk reduction and cost reduction. The clean tech efforts uh, uh, attempt to, to do more with less in many respects. And so if you're able to either use a more benign process where you don't have as many byproducts, or if you're able to do things more efficiently, this is of tremendous value uh, to, the, to the oil field service industry. The industry often is not the original inventor of technologies they deploy. They're very good at adapting technologies invented elsewhere and putting them to work in oil and gas extraction. And it takes a, a number of years for them to make that adoption. Oh, right? it does. The, my rule of thumb is uh, it takes 10 years for a new technology introduced into exploration and production to become broadly accepted. Well, we've seen a lot of ups and downs in pricing. Uh, how, how is it that the, the services side of the business manages all those ups and downs? Well, historically, the, uh, the service business tends to um, do it through reduction of headcount. And part of the, uh, the, the downside of this accordion is if the industry is operating at a lower level, um, and suddenly there's a mass expansion, there's a real shortage of experienced workers. And that's one of the big challenges the industry is facing today. If there was some means of leveling out uh, the, uh, these cycles, you would tend to have a more efficient and uh, a safer industry. Well, my friend, you enjoy an incredible reputation. Well, I'm pleased to hear it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming in today. And that wraps this episode of the Energy Makers Show, heard on the radio nationwide and seen right here at theenergymakers.com. I'm Paul Dickerson, and we'll see you next week.